not sure but where, where we stand at the moment like uh, but yeah maybe you can introduce yourself and then you can yeah introduce the concept as well um, and... okay great thanks Yabi um, so hi everyone it's a great pleasure to be here um, I'm calling in I'm dialing in from New York so it's a sunny day sunny morning here in New York a um, little bit of my background so um, I was born in Namibia and uh, I spent most of my childhood growing up in South Africa and uh, I had a passion for science and I uh, ended up doing theoretical physics and then later moving into statistical physics um, focusing on optimization and large data sets and I was lucky enough to uh, meet and work with Yabi when I was uh, at UCT and um, following that I broke into uh, banking so I worked as what's called a quantitative analyst in London at one of the big investment banks and um, for whatever strange reason I then managed to fall into advertising and it wasn't such a big uh, shift I mean it might sound a little crazy but uh, I moved into advertising because there were lots of similarities between what was happening in algorithmic trading um, on the stock market and what was going to be happening in advertising on something called real-time bidding for advertising so I could see a crossover of the skills that I'd learned there and I spent um, 10 years in London and then started an advertising company a digital advertising company called Adludio and um, with that I got the opportunity to come over here to the US and we expanded to the US as well and I've just recently stepped back from Adludio um, and very eager to help I think 10 Academy is a great initiative so uh, thanks to Yabi I've managed to get a little bit more involved and help out where I can so that's what brings me here today um, so without any um, you know stops there I'm, I'm sure you don't want to know more about me uh, let's get started with uh, talking more about algorithmic trading so I'm sure you guys already have a pretty good idea of what algorithmic trading is it's meant to be applied to the stock market or to something uh, it can equally be applied to something like the crypto markets the idea is pretty simple because most people trade on gut instinct or some information that they gather about a certain stock and of course when you're trading on the stock market you want to buy low sell high and there are ways that you can make money by um, you know when the market goes down as well the big challenge with the market is that emotion is always involved you know so you get nervous you see what's happening the price isn't going where you expect it to and then you as the person have to be the intermediary to act on those trades what the computer has done for us is it can remove emotion completely so you can have a far more systematic analytic and statistical approach to how you trade your stocks or whatever you want you can start looking at you know there's psychological phenomenon that happens on the stock market simple one would be there is a um a barrier that's associated with a certain price so as an example um a a stock would say have a barrier of two thousand dollars the price hasn't traded above that in 10 years and it will kind of bounce off that two thousand dollars every time it gets up to it until one day it breaks out of that barrier and if there's enough momentum and enough sentiment and enough good news about that stock it might run much higher so you could program a computer to take a look and identify when it breaks through that threshold and then make a speculative purchase and that can give you a really good return uh, because the computer is always on it's always monitoring it's always trying to see when those rules happen 
Another very simple example is, um, you know, identifying what the average trend is of a uh, stock. So as an example, you might take a moving average. So the average price over a certain period of time of a stock. Let's say you take uh, the moving average of um, 50 days and you have a price for that and you can see that the price that you currently have drop below that that would probably not be a good sign because suddenly you're trading in statistically the area where the price hasn't been over the last 50 days that's a bad trend but on the positive side if it's below the 50 day average and crosses up above it then you can say ah hold on this appears to be an upward trend we are now in a positive um, bull run for this particular stock so as it crosses that threshold i could um, write a very simple algorithm that would say cool let's buy it when it crosses and we sell it when it it goes below it again and if you do that effectively you should make money statistically uh, more often than you lose it now how confident are we that that strategy would work? This is where backtesting comes in. Backtesting is basically what we would know as experimental science, right? We're trying to see if this hypothesis that we put forward actually holds water. <clears throat> so what we would do is we'd say, great, if this strategy is really gonna work, I would have, would have expected it to statistically return a good um, margin for me over the last 10 years. So if I'm lucky enough to have 10 years of, question, of, of data, I would then run this uh, model and I'd say, okay, if it crosses up above the 50-day average and I buy and then sell when it crosses below the 50-day average, how, what are my returns? And you can actually even get this great measure called a sharp ratio, which basically tells you your risk to reward ratio, you know, because it's great. So say, for example, your back test proves that you could have made millions and done incredibly well. Is that just a statistical anomaly in the sense that you've chosen a very favorable period of time? Am I taking abnormal risks to make that return? So a sharp ratio allows you to normalize what, you, uh, what your returns are over a period of time based on the risk that you take. So those are some very basic ideas. I, threw th I flew through them very quickly. So I'll hand back to you guys. Uh, and after the questions, I'll tell you about a last section of algorithmic trading called arbitrage. Yeah. So any question technical things for example you know some of the the very hard elements that you would struggle in this week if it's your first time in this space is terminologies short long and kind of and, and other elements so whatever is you have heard you have seen as well as also you feel like it's so simple but why are people not so far completely you know solve this problem and anything that you wonder you can ask you can think that this is an afternoon so you know better if it, at least for jack it's in the morning but for most of you it's in the afternoon better if you kind of ask questions and then kind of get interactive instead of just ask only talking it's, uh, yeah yeah uh okay hi there jack um, we really appreciate your time. So I'm just going uh, straight to the question. I basically have two questions and I am going to formulate the second one in a moment, but just to be on the same page, it's like, uh, so, but as I uh, seem to understand it, so this whole back testing thing, like we, we have a strategy, right? We have a strategy and we have some algorithms that we wanted to implement in the future. So we basically don't know what exactly the outcome is going to be for our specific strategy. So it's like, 
we are taking all data prior to this point uh, for whatever time long uh, and we're basically uh, doing we're basically running that algorithm or our strategy on past data so we can have at, at least a, some kind of understanding of the whole uh, algorithm right so that's the main idea i think right correct that's 100 percent right i mean what you're trying to do is like you know think of it from an experimental science point of view is you're trying to see if there is some sort of fun fundamental working of the stock market or that particular uh, commodity that you're trading um, and it's very noisy so that means there's a lot of randomness but if your strategy is simple and it's clear it will play out that when you back test you'll be able to see a clear pattern there's no guarantee that that will hold into the future but it means on average you will make you will see similar returns okay great thanks i'll come i'll formulate my second question and come back to you real quick okay sure thing thanks for the question who's next okay can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I have two questions. One, yeah. some the, the terminology to be explained to me, and I guess to other members too. And my other question is some of more generalized one. So uh, let me start with the generalized one. So if you have to, like, if you get to write the algorithmic uh, trading method or trading uh, way, what would you rate it like from uh, out of a hundred based on like its success rate? And some of uh, a little bit additional question to this would be uh, what are the main drawbacks of this method, the algorithm trade? And my second question is uh, what is a key like that? Uh, yeah, that's my a terminology I want to be explained is K line. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, what did you say? K line. Yeah, K line data. What? What? The... I, so I'm afraid I don't know what K line data is. I'd need to look into that. Uh, so I, <laughs> I'll be honest. I can't help you with that one. Um, okay. But the, on the on the first question, let me see if I understand. You're basically saying, how do you know if the algorithm is good or not? Right? Like, what would you use as the factors to determine if it's good? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Cool. Yeah, good question. I mean, <clears throat> it depends on your view on the market, right? Like um, some people want to just make small gains, but at very low risk. And, um, you know, you might have to wait a very long time to achieve that. And you would build what's in optimization you'd call a figure of merit. So in other words, you would try and assign this as your goal for optimization. So you can use factors in your um, trading strategy that you then try and optimize. And then you can have like an optimi a meta optimization algorithm that runs on top of all of your algorithms and says, in the current climate, given my goals, which of these algorithms is going to serve me best? Um, but that's a very wishy-washy answer. Let me try and see if I can be more specific. So in my view, <clears throat> the typical things you want to look at are obviously your return. The sharp ratio gives you the most perspective because very often if you look at just return, it can just be something happened in the market your algorithm caught a good opportunity that came up or say, for example, there's a, another war or something that's going to have a huge impact on the market. It might not be an underlying um, trend that you've seen in the market. That is a one piece of no news that came out and, um, uh, you know, impacted the market. So, what you really want to do is you want to be able to say what is my risk adjusted return and that's what the sharp ratio does then you want to say okay on over this period that i'm back tested 
how much money there were points where I'm losing money right like I'll take a position the market will move a little bit randomly and I will be losing money during that period what is the maximum amount of money that I am losing at any period during the back test that's called the maximum drawdown so it means how much money during the, my testing period was I losing what was the most I was losing at any one point because if your algorithm is good, you should see that being quite small. You don't want to see suddenly half of whatever you put in was at risk. That's a bad algorithm because things can happen. You can close out your position and then, you know, you might have made one or two 5% gains consistently and then all of a sudden you wiped out 50%. That's not a good position to be in. So your max drawdown is very good, is very important. And then yeah, I think consistency, you know, being able to show that um, regardless of the market conditions, uh, whether the trend is up or the trend is down, you've got a set of algorithms or you've got a strategy that would be able to consistently, uh, at the very least, not lose money. Um, that that's what your factors need to add up to. That's how you know you've got a good algorithm. I hope that addresses your question. And, and, and for the K line, I think it's just basically a candlestick. Uh, it's another name. I think, you know, reference would just give you just a bar that, that highlights basically the opening. I think uh, there is a lot of terminologies there opening price, the closing price, the minimum, the maximum uh, in it. And then, of course, another terminology is a bull market versus uh, uh, the bull and the, the other one is the bear market. So yeah. now it's so much when you get to the financial terminologies, a lot of this is just like the normal terminologies. There's so much for a very small, what you consider a big name, might be just reflecting an average of something, you know, because for a good reason, they have been studying these graphs for like, you know, so many people um, hiring so many advanced people. So of course they want to summarize everything that is visible in a graph in basically, you know, they, they named it just like on earth, you know, we named every place so that we can identify. It. And that makes it sometimes very hard, like even just, a certain line, you know, a certain form of falling is given some name. Just just that. And then you, you think like it's a complex name, but then you're like, no, just this falling in a certain period has that name, which really is, in this case, you know, bull market is a name that basically just tells you that uh, something is going up, right? And then uh, bear market is just, and then now for how long should it be? I mean, you can always just interchangeably use it when it's going down or up, but there might be also technical terminologies in it. But so this one of the K-line or candlesticks are just usually defined in a specific period of time. And usually it could be a, like you synthesize it or everybody synthesize it. And then again, you have to ask, so there is only orders, like there is order book. That's just what is actually real. Is just people order like they they buy sell different types of of course financial things short you know, long and all that and then somebody else just for the sake of organizing this trade book they would create a form of candle that candle means on a specific period of time it could be a one minute candle in that one minute candle they would basically put all the trades sort them and then they kind of put okay what is the opening of at that time just for the start of that candle and what is the closing and then they say within that what is the maximum and what is the minimum and then they form basically that candle and then that's what you usually see in a graph so you know like a lot of these things is just confusing for i mean when you come first to this market or to, to this space the terminology is going to be so yes ask them uh, but just that you know k-line is just candlestick which is basically and that candlestick can be done for a one minute, one hour, one day, a hundred day, if you want. It's just, and then within that, you, you bring together all, every trade that happens, 
within a specific, of course, also exchange. And then you arrange them in a certain order as like opening price, closing price, the minimum within that, the maximum within that, and then you form them under. Okay. So hopefully that is clear that we can go to Adiat. You had uh, your, your hands raised. Um, yeah, sorry. I got a snack, so I have to. So my, my question was actually, is it fact checking? I, I, wanted to, I wanted to fact check what my understanding about back testing mean in, in when it comes to implementing it in modeling. Okay, so, so we have a data set and we've processed this data set in a way to predict one particular param, parameter. So does that set back testing mean that, um, does it mean that somebody can pick a parameter to predict based on orders or be able to drop any other one or pick a, or pick a range for any other parameter to predict one? So I think what you're you're asking is to, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you're asking is is there a, so when we have an algorithm, you're asking are there particular parameters that we need to look to see what would be the best for our back test? Is that right? Or are you asking can we predict what the parameters would be best for the future? Um, can you just clarify that for me? Oh, I'm, I'm asking if uh, if we can create an algorithm in a way that we can pick the parameters to predict. So, um, I think I understand what you're saying. I think you're asking, again, correct me if I'm wrong, when you create your back test, you're going to have certain parameters like let's use that very trivial example of the moving average so i chose 50 day moving average right and then we might run okay. that on our back test what you're asking is is there a way that i can then uh, we can then optimize that 50 days to be something that will give us the best return is that right Yes, and I'm asking if that's the way backtesting works, or it just um, it just have to be one parameter, and then every other thing works with that one parameter. Well, you can do it either way, but I think I think it makes sense to try and find the best parameters. Now, the danger, and I'm sure you've seen this in other things that you work on, is overfitting to the data, right? where you over engineer, you choose too specifically the parameter that works best with the data you have, right? So you find, say you've only got a year's worth of data and you find the best parameters for your algorithm that work in the past year, but that's no guarantee that they will then work moving forward. What you're actually looking for is the most robust parameters and a good way to address this is <clears throat> to save a little bit of a surprise for yourself so what i mean by that is say for example you take the law of the you've got 12 months of data from month one to month 11 you try and find your best parameters then you run that that algorithm on um your your last month the 12th month's worth of data and you see how it performs that gives you some indication of the data that you held back was it uh did it still perform in a predictable way or did it completely mismatch in which case you probably overfitted to the previous 11 months right so the goal is not necessarily to find the best parameters, because then you've probably fallen into the trap of overfitting to the data you have. You want the most robust. In other words, it doesn't matter if the data changes, you still have very similar results. 
Okay. So that means that when implementing this, we find like uh, we, we it's two parameters. Okay. It you can have a parameter. I mean, simpler is better, right? So if you have two parameters, that's great. But you can have as many as you want. Um, it just makes it more complex. And of course, with optimization, it makes it difficult then to know if you change a bunch of those parameters, which one was actually the one that had the biggest impact. So simpler is definitely better, especially as we start in this field. So less parameters, definitely more powerful. Yeah. I just want to add also Thank you. there slightly, maybe like for other people also, it might help. So there are two things. One is the model and another is the parameters in the model. So a model is basically what you would choose as, let's say, right now, if you are comparing one um, exponential moving average, it is a type of model that is specified by, let's say, two parameters. Uh, each of them described, as Jacques earlier said, one is a longer window that you average, and the other one is a shorter window you average. So it's both are average, but different types of basically how far in the past do you go from your current position. Now, those two are called parameters of the model. Now, and, and so within that model, you can explore the, of course, the optimal parameters that would, prob that would give you based on a certain metric. If your metric is, you know, number of successes, or the, that means the number of successes that you, you say it will go up that, and then the market went up. Of course, we are looking back in time. That's why it's back, back testing. That's, yeah, great. You could, I think Jacques earlier also mentioned about sharp ratio, you could use that one. You could also use return, like which basically means like all you care is that ultimately after you do this, that, 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 did you get ultimately the sum of that? Because the statistical thing, the sum of it, you know, did you get a positive return or a negative return? Or, you know, you can use, of course, a combination of multiple other metrics. So the one part you have to distinguish is that what is a model and then the parameters of the model. Now that is exponential moving average, but then there could be another LSTM. LSTM is another type which you now fit and it has different types of parameter. It's being, um, being the, basically it's different types of hyperparameters we call them, right? So your learning rate, your this, your number of, you know, the architecture, your number of neurons, all those things can be like parameters of that LSD model. And the same goes for different. So every time you think of a model, think of a model as being one, and then a model has parameters. And usually within that model, we try to search the optimal parameters that that provide. So hopefully that's clear, just because sometimes there are these confusions um, between model and a model parameter. And then we sometimes compare multiple models as well. So not only one model, but we also just want, we want to test this model, that model, that model. So there could be N number of models. And then within one model, there could be M number of parameters. So, you know, that's why when Jacques says two parameters, usually for a given model, if the model has so much parameters, it's complex to fit. But if it has simpler model, you know, if it's a simpler model, that means it has sim smaller number of parameters, Usually, it's easier to explain and understand. Just uh, with that, let me, Mohammed. So, yeah, go on. Yet. So you are saying it's it's better to have multiple models and then pull those models when we need the multiple model that that predicts just one or two parameters and then pull them when we need the parameter. We need to predict the, that particular parameter. So it's better to do that than to have one model that do all the job. You have to choose both uh, what works for you. And usually okay. a simpler model is better. And uh, usually a simpler model means something that you can explain. If it's a, it's a less theme, for example, it's great. It might work, but you might not explain it. Okay. If it's like exponential moving average or something that is very simple model, you know why it works because it's just, yeah, it's kind of, you know, you, you can understand why a certain 
parameters are good or you know so it, it, it is not a recommendation it's just saying when you start it's easier to understand the model like you know if it's complex you sometimes don't have any way of controlling or improving it you know you, you don't know if it works if it were if it works great but if it doesn't work you probably sometimes don't know where to start to, to modify it but while if it's a simpler model you basically be able to explain why it doesn't work or why it does work so you have a much much better simpler life or simpler um, and usually they are powerful as well okay thank you great Mohammed. so can you hear me I can hear you, Mohammed. yes good morning back morning so, yes um i have uh, i have uh, i want you to reflect on my understanding so i could we could be in the same beat so um back back, back this thing for example like a trading bot, bots uh, in crypto market that look uh, through the, the, the fluctuation of prices uh, uh, throughout a certain period of time and consider uh, an action a certain action if the price is break to uh, a threshold so buy or sell uh, like crypto or nfts or some sort of assets am i right that is correct that's correct so you know a nice simple way to understand it is i think back in the early days i i might have this wrong but there used to be this um surge on the weekends for crypto so literally the simplest strategy that you could do that would be very effective is buy a crypto on a friday and sell it on a monday and that would make you an, a disproportionate return um, with very little risk in the early days of crypto because most people would leave their day jobs suddenly be playing around with crypto on the weekend and um, the the prices would fluctuate and generally go up so it's trying to find those trends and then back testing to prove that that is the case okay so how how this is different from the normal prediction or it it's some some sort of so that back testing is one of uh the the normal prediction well when you say normal prediction i'm not quite sure i understand what would a normal prediction be uh, so that we have uh, a previous data, for example, 12 now, and we uh, we run our model on based on that data and to predict some uh, future values. Well, you're not predicting the values, right? Uh, what, right. You're, what you're doing is you're writing an algorithm that says, based on the statistical trends, these are the patterns of trading that I will implement. So I don't think those two are equivalent because you might be able to guesstimate, but I don't think it's, I mean, you know, so many people get price predictions wrong. Why would you suddenly believe that a computer would get it more accurate? You know, that's not what we're saying. What you're trying to do is exactly like I explained now, if you find a, a previous um, anomaly in the market where you say, okay, well, if I just employ this strategy of buying on the Friday, selling on the Monday, I'm not making a prediction on what that price would be, but I'm certainly say, seeing that statistically it's going to be higher. My return is going to be higher and I'm going to outperform the market than just generally investing at any particular time. So it's finding those strategies that you're actually after. And the big difference between that and trying to take a prediction on the market is usually when you're looking at a prediction on the market, you look at the fundamentals of the company, right? All the, stuff, all the crypto. And you're saying, okay, here's how I would value that company based on the fundamentals and therefore i make a guesstimate 
that at these returns, at this rate, with a fundamental value of this company, it's worth that. That's called value investing. You can write a bot to do that, but that is not necessarily what algorithmic trading in its broadest sense is about. Okay, I get you. Uh, so my my second question is, so what I understood that algorithmic trading um, is here to remove human emotions from trading process. So um, does, does that, because uh, what I understand, the market has its own complexity. So as the human mind could understand uh, the, human, the, the market complexity, the algorithms couldn't do that. So we replaced the human uh, uh, emotions uh, and take also the human complexity of understanding the market and replace it with algorithmic thinking or algorithmic trading. How how that how that gap could be filled? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, the tricky thing, the reason why we haven't, like Yabi says, cracked um, this so that you know everyone who writes an algorithm suddenly becomes a billionaire um, is because the market is very complex. It has loads and loads of noise in it. So it's very difficult to determine a signal, a clear signal for what you're trying to do. Um, and that's the challenge. You know, we're, we're all hunting for signal in a very noisy environment. And I suppose the danger as humans is we're very good at interpreting a lot of data and our minds are engineered for looking for patterns. The problem is when it's that noisy, sometimes we see patterns that aren't there. Same for bots, but you know, definitely the case for humans. The more experienced you are, probably the better you are at finding those fundamental uh, signals. Um, so that's the challenge. And then I must, uh, I must remember, once I've done the questions, I'll tell you guys a little bit about arbitrage which is another thing that computers are very well and, and algorithms are very well suited to, to exploiting if they can be found. And, and, and just again, in the addition, I think, you know, a much more feeling what I observe sometimes there could be some misunderstanding or so there are three types of things, right? One is simulation. You know, if you are simulating a, a flight, if you are learning, you basically could just sit in a computer game or it could just be in an actual flight environment that is basically, which has reproduced faithfully a number of practical things, including fog, including vibrations, including, you know, this and that. And in a, also in crypto, like in this back testing, there are a number of things. So what happens in an actual trading is that you just give some amount, you pay for every trading, right? So it's basically because you say like, I'm, 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 I'm thinking it's going to go up and I'm buying, like I want to buy 10, you know, Solana for um, now with this price. And then even there, there are certain really com terminologies that you would face. There is called market price. There is called this and that and that, that you would have to determine which way. The market price means once I send the signal, if the market went from like, when I was calculating my signal, it was, it was Solana was trading, let's say at $30. Now, when I send that signal that I calculated, I will make a profit. But there is a delay, right? And then there is a delay and then it just goes out. I send my price and then uh, let's say because of markets are very, very sometimes fast responding, it went by the time it, it maybe was like one second or two seconds, it went from, you know, 30, you know, whatever, $30, it could have gone to like $80. Normally it doesn't happen, but you're saying I'm gonna buy, buy that. Of course, your calculation could be very wrong if you had known after you know one second the price would go there. So that's called the market price. But also you can uh, limit order. There are other types of order 
where you specify whatever it is, I'm not going to buy above this amount, right? So that's, and then if that is the case, then you will wait in the market longer until your order are executed or called filled. Now, in the, in the back testing, that you have to actually, do you simulate that? You know, do you, do you actually introduce trading fees that would actually, you know, show and, and kind of like many other details such as, such as this. And given that in the market, you'll always know, you know, after some, some things happen, there are delays, do you introduce them? And are you executing like that in, to the, the complexity of your trading environment or like, for example, when you select, when we ask you, there are three free, free trade, you know, the other also is like the back trader and then also vector BT. So these are different back, back testing methods. They have implemented their own different elements and some of them are closer to reality as if it's for the flight, you know, the one that actually airline companies use and others could look like a game, you know, it's like still, you know, the, the physics is there, but not every single detail um, is there. So that, that is one other complexity in, in back testing. And so if you don't take into account all of that and then you just ideal simulation and ideal just uh, actually, sometimes that looks like you have done it before for sales prediction. Usually we don't, in sales prediction, we don't ask you, we didn't ask you in that, in that project, we didn't ask you to actually simulate people, people coming in in the supermarket, buying and their decisions. You didn't incorporate that element. You only just simply said, okay, th this is a number of sales, you know, like, um, and by this amount. So that's called sometimes when you say maybe Muhammad normal, you may be referring, it's all the same. It's just that the complexity of your, your, your model matters. And in financial markets, you really sometimes back testing reflects a lot more, it incorporates, at least mostly, I mean, uh, for practical reasons, you incorporate delays, you incorporate direct, like basically it's called broker, like you have that element that is executing all of the type of delays based on, of course, the data that is there. So hopefully that will make uniformize it. Okay, um, so what I understand, uh, a lot of- Your voice is quite low. I don't understand, I, I'm slightly in a background, Okay, go on. How, how about now? Great, yeah. So uh, what I understand is uh, we are trying with backtesting to understand how the market is work, not the market, not the what the market produce. We are, we are uh, in, have interest in, in, in understanding how the market is working, not the, the producer, not the products of the market itself. What do you mean by that? Uh, by that, I mean uh, how how the trend of um, of the prices is going, and uh, like Jack said, uh, how how the human uh, nature tend to buy and sell, uh, for example, cryptocurrency, not how the prices is going up and down. We we are interested in searching uh, for the human or uh, the market uh, working. Mm, mechanism i think uh i think that's fair mohammed we, we just have to be careful right like w what a algorithm or strategy represents is you have i mean we're scientists right we we're trying to reverse engineer something that's way more complex than nature so we have a hypothesis that we see a trend or a pattern of behavior in the market and we then write an algorithm a bot that tries to prove that um, and that's what we do we then back test it and try and say okay statistically i think this is actually true my hypothesis is correct and i use those parameters in my back test to validate that and then i hope that 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 mechanism or um, behavior in the market continues because it can change it's a dynamic system um, so that's a good way of looking at it you're just looking for these snippets of time during which you can uh, in a predictable way say this is a strategy that will work okay I get that thank you 
great. And also you have to remember the market, the people, of course, when we think of orders, even we look at candles, they are kind of bunch of people have traded. And those bunch of people come and traded for with that price for that amount of volume for different reasons. And usually statistical means that you really are not isolating. It's it's called it's not agent based. So what you are referring sometimes is called agent based modeling. That means you actually you know populating kind of agents that does that. There are some kind of models like that, but in this case, exactly you're right. We are modeling statistically. That means we're not looking at individual agents, but we're looking at the phenomena, the behavior that is established, punched in a certain period of time. And then we're trying to estimate that and then kind of, you know, try to predict. Of course, that is much more simpler than if you were to go in agent based. Even that agent based is too much, too complex, too complex for. Um, and so usually, I don't know, like maybe bigger, bigger companies who really want to study the market, uh, economists might do that. Um, but usually traders, they don't care about agents usually, but you're right. Fissa? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of formed my second question. And so in order to create a really uh, solid uh, strategy or a solid algorithm, I think we actually need to understand this basic uh, trading terminologies. So uh, this is a kind of a business understanding question. So uh, we will definitely go on and uh, see what these terminologies are and what they mean, but in a very uh, high level or in a very, you know, uh, from your perspective, what are the most, like, I don't want to limit the question so much, but what, what do you think are the most important trading terminologies one needs to know in order to create this solid type of uh, uh, algorithms or strategies? Okay, um, it's a good question. It's difficult for me to answer because, you know, I, 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 I've forgotten most of the things that I um, thought were important. They're now just... Uh, part of my everyday vocabulary. So let's see. Um, I mean, understanding your open and closing prices, so that as it all, you know, just understanding these candlesticks that Yabi was talking about, uh, which basically is a way of saying these are the bounds of um, what has traded in a given time. And usually there's one tick to say, where the price started and a second tick to see where it ended. If it ended below where it started, it's called uh, a negative candle or it's usually displayed in red. And if it's above, it's displayed in green to say it started here and it went here and it ended here. But you'll see there's a line that's supposed to look like the wick in the candle at the top and the bottom that shows how it fluctuated during that time period with the lowest point and the highest point. So understanding that, understanding an order book. So understanding, you know, remember that trading on the stock market is basically an auction, which means that um, you're going to have bids and offers and what the market does is it automatically fulfills when the bids and offers are at the same price. But you can put a bid and an offer that is very far away from where the current price is. So understanding how your order book works is really important. And it's that you get these uh, momentum, um, so your volume signals. So that tells you how much is being traded at any particular given time or a time interval. So clearly something is happening if your volume shoots up. If your average volume is, say, trades of 500 million in a day and suddenly you've got 10 million, I mean, um, 10 billion in a day, something's happened. You know, either the market is in meltdown, something exciting is happening with that particular stock. So understanding volume and how that impacts 
um, the mechanics of what's happening on the day is super important. And then your usual statistical things, you know, how can you apply linear regression? How can you apply moving averages? Um, how can you use momentum indicators in all of this? Just understanding those basics should give you a good starting point. Thank you, really nice. Cool. There's also a question on the text. So, uh, what what do you, what do twenty day and fifty day moving average mean? And are those the only we are having? And what do they refer to the market? So it it basically is, you know, average just as the the name says, but it's not just you know you can have one day. 20, 30 day, you know, whatever day. And so it's not just only like now when you have in the way that you put it 20 day and 50 days, that basically means one is a smaller window and the other one is a longer window. If you average something on 50 days, that's long compared to if you average in 20 days, as simple as that. But you sh the number 20, 50, there's no magic about it. You, and when you search parameters, you search for combinations within, of course, these moving average windows, right? Within the moving average models, you basically search for parameters that are, that are basically that. So no particular attachment. There might be some people use 20 and 50 for some thing. I don't know, but um, it has nothing got to do with like, 20 seems to just as 20, 50 it seems as 50. But it can be one and three, you know, one in hundred, um, twenty and seven hundred, if you want to, you know, it's it's whatever you 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 just want to average. So hopefully that is clear because it's it's basically usually when you come in, people talk about this twenty day whatever as if you know them, and sometimes it might you might have been seeing twenty and fifty more regularly than other numbers, and you might think they are special. They may be special for in some modeling techniques, but not particularly. I mean, if you ask me for me, it's just that they are just two numbers, but you know, it's, it's that hopefully Michael, that's clear in audience. Okay. That's, um, no questions, but any other questions? Otherwise we can also allow, uh, Jacques just to then switch maybe to arbitrage because sometimes the more you learn about things, the more the, the, the other parts gets clarified as well, because arbitrage is one type of marketing or financial, what, what we call, um, so the strategies that are still kind of part of trading, but now you know slightly more, so maybe why not just jump. What is yeah. arbitrage? Because it would connect with other things that people have heard already. Yeah, I mean, the best way to explain arbitrage, arbitrage is basically a guaranteed way of making a return. So, um, I don't know, I can't think, a, a good example, a good example would be, um, we all love football, right? So, uh, if, if, for example, we were to bet on a football game, there would only be three possible outcomes. Team A wins, team B wins, or uh, there is a draw. Um, so if we have betting odds that say, there's so much probability that team A wins, there's so much probability that team B wins, and there's so much probability that there is a, a, a draw. And these are the odds that I give you when you bet for each one of those. If you add all of those up, you're, you'll get a number that's less than one. Because basically as a betting exchange, I want to make sure that I guarantee a positive return. If everyone bets, I make money at the end of the day. But you can find anomalies in the market where say, for example, you go to a, bet, a betting exchange that is in the hometown of team A, they're probably going to skew their statistics a little bit, 
to be in favor of Team A. You'll find a similar phenomenon in the hometown of Team B. And then all of a sudden, you can end up with a very unique situation where if you place a bet in this particular betting agency that Team A wins, and you bet it uh, uh, on the fact that Team B wins, and you bet on Team C, if you find the right betting odds, you can find an instance where you get more, you get a guaranteed return. So that means it doesn't matter what the outcome was. It doesn't matter whether Team A won, Team B won, or, team, or, or it was a draw, you will be guaranteed a return. That's called arbitrage. Another very common example is you have these um, exchanges between currencies, right? Where if I switch from dollars to pounds, from pounds to Japanese yen, and then from yen back to dollars, if I do that at the right moment in time, because remember the prices fluctuate and they're dynamic, if I do that, if I time that well, I'll end up with more dollars than what I started with. That is arbitrage. That means you found a guaranteed way of return um, as opposed to statistical arbitrage, which is more what we were doing uh, with the algorithmic trading, where over a long period of time, I'm guaranteed that I should make a, a good return. This is looking for anomalies in the market, uh, disparities in the market, where I can use the algorithm and the computer to trade very quickly and um, get a guaranteed return. So that happens in crypto quite regularly. In a similar way to what I said about the betting exchanges, you can go and take a look at the price for Bitcoin on one uh, exchange and uh, take a look at the price on another exchange. And very often, for a brief moment, there will be a disparity on those two numbers. So if you buy here, sell there, you'll make more money instantly than, um, than, than holding that investment and hoping it goes in a positive direction. Similarly to the, uh, to the, um, the currency exchange one, you have um, exchanges between crypto coins. So you can have, you can buy one coin change it for another coin, change it for another coin, and change it back to your original coin, and you'll end up with more money than what you started, if you've done that correctly. So that's what arbitrage is, and there the mindset is a little different. You're still creating an algorithm, but you're looking, it's more watching for opportunities where there are anomalies in the market, where you can then seize them and make a guaranteed return. Let me know if that makes sense and if you have any questions. This is great. So any other question? I think this hopefully, and, and you have to know just the market is, is not made by nature. It's made by humans participating and humans created boats and then before humans and bots, and mostly now bots, because no one trusts themselves. So you're dealing with bots whose idea is basically written either in some predictive, predictable way or unpredictable way by other humans. And so that's why these things happen. You know, as soon as you have multiple people doing things differently, and there is, of course, you know, the market, unfortunately, has a certain property called stationarity. It doesn't have stationarity because it's completely determined by news and many other things. And not everyone has equal information. Some have equal information. Some have influential powers. They can influence the market than another because they have much more stock in that, much more equity in that, and therefore they can actually sell to influence the market, but a normal trader probably as might not be able to do that. So, you know, not everyone has equal power, not everyone has equal information. And so, and the stationarity means also it's, it's kind of an, uh, applying some kind of traditional statistics usually doesn't work as much uh, as other things like where, you know, if it's nature, 
you know, you, you think that there is this unchangeable thing in the background that's generating this process, while market is generated by a process that is non-stationary. And so that, you know, that, that's kind of way of thinking is, is very, um, in the fundamental sense, is, is different. But that's where also opportunities lie. Right? Because humans co sometimes have this coherence uh, in the wrong way or in the right way or in this way or in that way. And yeah, so I will give to Mohammed and Emitna. So uh, Mohammed, you can continue. Yes. Um, uh, can Can you specify one more famous example for back test algorithms that lose huge amount of money? Or uh, yes, a famous example. A famous example. Um... I mean, like that's not going to be publicly known because, you know, each one of these banks uh, would have an investment division where they'll employ a whole bunch of smart people to uh, do these kinds of tests. And if some poor guy or girl uh, went and wrote the algorithm wrong or did something incorrect, uh, it can look very promising, but then when they go live to trade, it's a disaster and they lose a, a bunch of money. Um, they're not going to publicize that. So I don't know if there's like a, a, um, a very well known example of it. I suppose the best working example I can give uh, for you is um, during some of the uh, crashes that we've seen uh, because lots of institutions use these stock orders which basically means that if a price comes down to this um, i will sell and because there are so many stacked close to each other and the price fell so quickly it triggered all of these sell orders and it caused a huge cascade and still the way to kind of stop that from happening is like the same as what they used all the way back maybe a hundred years ago, which is they cease trading just to say, okay, everyone calm down, take a breath. <laughs> let's, let's gather our thoughts before things tumble even more out of control. So that's the only sort of practical example I can give you of things tumbling because of uh, the sort of electronic systems we have in place now. But um, as far as publicly known back tests failing, uh, that would be quite coveted information that I doubt any investment bank would really share. I'm sure there's lots of speculation, but um, no, I doubt, I doubt somebody would share that. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, is there any uh, steps we should um, take to minimize the risk? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about how you, uh, how you put together your your um your results from your back test right what do you weight as important like the sharp ratio the return the max drawdown um and then there's a whole bunch of other uh, statistics that you can get about it so it's how do you craft those together in such a way that you feel this is a reliable means to make a return or this is a safe means to make a return. And it's done? Uh, yes. Um, hello. I I think I um I don't completely I don't understand something basic about back back testing. So we're having all of this historical data and then we have an algorithm or a trade uh, strategy that we want to test on our data. But then okay uh when we like we were testing a, a strategy that how would it have worked if it was used before but the decisions that that would be taken by this strategy might have affected uh, would it affect the market and then uh, are we supposed in our practice are we supposed to like uh, program a way to to predict how the the market would have we would would have reacted to i don't know if i'm, I'm making sense uh, oh no that's excellent question excellent question like so, i completely uh, 
or are we assuming that uh, our trade uh, strategy would have no effect? There is no back reactions, let's say. I don't know. Okay. Ex excellent question. Um, that you, look, that this is the biggest problem of the market. It's dynamic. So you do something, it learns. Maybe there's another, out, like Yabi says, there's another bot waiting for you to do what you were going to do, and then it reacts and it causes a cascade. So yes, there's tons of things. The good assumption that we can make, the volumes are so huge in uh, the, the in trading uh, most things at the moment, you will have absolutely no impact. Um, you know, it's only, and this is like a whole nother level of trading, but you have algorithms, for example, that are supposed to minimize your impact of selling but that's only if you're selling like 10 billion dollars worth of a particular uh, crypto or trade or whatever it might be it's astronomical numbers that you're actually having to do and then there's like a whole different world of back testing and creating algorithms that then sell it where it's not like you just place one order if somebody saw an order for like a huge amount of money, they'd be like, oh my gosh, that person is selling. Why are they selling? I should sell too. So, you know, and then that person's gonna get a bad price on their sale, right? So um, uh, what, what you wanna do is be very clever about that when you get to those big numbers. But for the moment, thankfully, we don't need to worry about it. We have next to no impact on the market as a whole. Okay, um, I get it. So it's the assumption, the basic assumption that we have no, that is small back reaction. Okay, perfect. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for the question. But but Evidan, for example, just I want to say, so you felt you didn't understand, but the, you know the the question you asked is the most essential and important, and not only important, it really describes what back test is. Sometimes there is this thing of, you know, underestimating how much you understand actually. And that, that part, exactly what you asked, is, is really about going back and, and looking with this strategy, how did the market reacted? And you, you know how the market has reacted because you are in the past, in the past, and then you have also, within that past, you have the future. The, for the future, but if you go back, if you transport yourself like you know, one day ago and you, kind of make a prediction for the next hour, you have that data. So then then you can make that prediction based on your algorithm, and then you can compute given the truth, which is what already happened, and then your prediction, then you, you make some kind of you know, assessment. So the basically what we call a broker would in, in that simulator basically tells you like, okay, you have made this, you lost or you gained. So that's what it says, and that's what you described, and that's very, very exactly what backtest is. So you actually understand more than what you think you do. You do it's like exactly to the point. Also, the self interaction is exactly, you know, it's an important element. Of course, it's at a higher level, but even knowing that is just what what is also the limitations, right? And you only have what didn't happen there. You know, it's it's basically. If you let's order so much, uh, I think most of the time in the back test, what we look at is actually signals, and and we 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 check about how our signal, what would have, what would, what kind of profit or return would we have, given a signal, given we generate a signal, so we don't care about the actual absolute value of the money. Because that's why usually in the back test, you know, we give just 1,000. It's okay. You can start with 100 as well. Because the absolute number of the, the, the part is not important in the back test. It's mostly the signal that is more important for exactly this reason. Because otherwise you have to take care of a lot more of like this type of effects. But what you want in the back test is that you would just say, okay, based on whatever computation algorithm, I think the market would go up or the market would go down. And then you can also specify how up it will be or how low it, it will be. And then you can estimate if you want to, how much within the kind of, let's call it $1,000 you, you assume you start with. 
and then you say, is it 90% of it that I'm betting? Or you can do that as well. But the absolute number, whether you have put 1,000 or a 1 million, shouldn't be important in most of our tests because that, you know, the, we want only the fractional numbers um, for that similar reasons as well. So, but very, very good. I just want to stress that you, you asked a very important, good question and you understood exactly what is going on. So, you know, yeah, you know, don't feel you didn't understand it. I think that's just what I, what I mean. Okay. Um, okay. I see there are a few questions in the, in the chat that I missed. So let me quickly go through them and see if I can quickly answer them. Um, MT9, I, I think you asking here is looking for such opportunities for arbitrage, a form of back testing. So arbitrage is less back testing because actually most arbitrage opportunities happen on a very, very short time scale. So it's more about engineering something that can watch for a particular arbitrage opportunity and then very quickly react on that arbitrage opportunity. So it's more like a bot that you want to write that can be constantly monitoring a situation. And then when it spots an anomaly, uh, a disproportionate, uh, you know, an inefficiency in the market, it acts to take advantage. Um, and you can sh shadow trade that, which means that you don't actually trade it, but you can just run it for a period of time and say, great, how many of these fictional opportunities did you find and then um, how quickly would we have been able to execute so you didn't actually do it but you kind of waited and identified and noted that that was an arbitrage opportunity uh, margaret what type of algorithms work well for arbitrage um, so I mean, that's a difficult question because actually what you're doing is you're trying to find arbitrage opportunities. Like, um, so it's not necessarily the algorithm that's going to work well. It's more identifying the opportunity for arbitrage. Then once you have the, the once you've identified and you say, oh, okay, like you get something called exchange arbitrage where different exchanges might sell the same stock or coin at the at a different not stocks uh, coins at a particular pr uh, different prices and for that reason I can uh, that's an arbitrage opportunity the key thing there is how well I've engineered my system um, can I then uh, very quickly trade that identify it trade it and do I know the limits of those for example those exchanges there might be other things statistics from a theoretical point of view, it might look like it's a very good trade, but in practice, what could happen is that that exchange has a limit on how much you can draw, or they charge you when you draw the money. So you made a two to 5% arbitrage opportunity. You used $100 to do that, so you've made $5. And then if you draw your $105 from that exchange, they charge you 10% or they charge you a flat rate of ten dollars so in actual fact you've lost five dollars on that arbitrage opportunity so those are the things you need to think about for arbitrage margaret does that mean you need to have a lot of parameters stored and tested since the market can be unpredictable what you want to be able to do is have tested lots of parameters and lots of algorithms because as i said the sort of golden nugget that you're looking for is the algorithm and the parameters that are the most robust that means that in different circumstances different times those parameters don't need to change in order to give you a predictable return that's really what you're looking for um, to get that you have to run through a lot of simulations but that's what you're ultimately looking for. Because if you're constantly going to be changing to try and match the market, it's going back to what Yabi said, more complexity, more the more difficulty you have in actually knowing how the dynamics work and the less likely you are to succeed with that algorithm. 
Um, let's see, Mohammed, Margaret, could you take us through the automation process done in real time bidding to ensure or at least try to ensure arbitrage? Um, so hopefully that's something we kind of covered off. Uh, you know, you need to think how quickly you can execute. So for example, if you're doing that sort of run through a crypto where you go to Bitcoin, to Ethereum, to Solana, and then back to Bitcoin, where you can trade between those different coins uh, and they have prices between them. It's about how quickly you can do that. Um, if you can do that efficiently, you should make a, a return. Um, so that arbitrage is more about the engineering than about trying to identify the opportunity. The, the smaller the opportunity, the better your engineering has to be. Michael, I think I got the idea of end a moving average, however, I can't imagine how we are able to extract or look for a sell or buy signal out of the cross between the two moving averages. I've seen some YouTube videos that say like when this one is above this one, it is a sell signal, blah, blah. How do we interpret the cross section between the moving averages? Well, I think the best way to look at it is you're trying to say, like, look, the price in the market is always dynamic. It's always determined at a particular point in time on how much somebody is willing to pay to get that particular coin or crypto or um, uh, stock. What you're doing when you're averaging is you're saying, well, over this period of time, what was the average price that someone was looking to get, right? So what you're saying is this could be an indicator for the sentiment of the people that are buying or selling, right? So if I'm saying the average over the last 20 days is this, and here's my price, and then suddenly, my current price crosses that or my shorter moving uh, average crosses that and goes up. That means that right now, over a shorter period of time, um, the sentiment is willing to pay a higher price than what we did over a longer period of time. That means it's a positive or upward sentiment. So that is the very rough interpretation of what crossing moving averages means. It means the sentiment for paying a certain price uh, has increased over a, a, a particular uh, time span. So in this case, a shorter time span, if you wanna take the live price and see how that crossed over say a 50 day moving average and it goes up through it, that means you're in positive territory. You want to perhaps buy it and hold and then sell when it crosses below it because it's saying, well, you're moving into a negative sentiment and the average is lagging and will catch up with that. Hope that makes sense. Um, Thank you very much, that makes sense. Perfect. Um, okay. And I think that's it. Uh, what's the last one? Is there any backtesting wheels um not sure i understand that one muhammad yeah. can you perhaps can I explain? Yes. yeah please explain so uh but by wheels i mean that um a couple of uh, companies that want to dominate a specific market let's say uh, the stock market so tesla uh, have uh, their stock prices uh, in the low they will try to use the the back testing uh, with the reverse engineer engineering so that it could lift the prices of their market of, of their uh, stocks did you get me so you're saying that um some people might use uh, back testing as a marketing tool to try and push up their price yes uh for example, uh, if their if if their prices um, tends to be in a specific certain of time to be low, they will try to use that uh, to buy, uh, for example, their stocks with the higher prices, so that they can advance. Ah, okay, okay. So you're saying like a pro uh, a company could use back testing to kind of um, rebuy some of their stock. 
for their benefits, not to buy for, for their own, but for um, making their stocks prices higher. So companies absolutely do that. Um, you know, they don't use back testing principles. Uh, what they will do is like, because remember, usually um, a company that is traded on the stock market is publicly traded. That means there are certain rules that they have to follow. And those rules are uh, the implementation of those rules is, are governed by the board, the a, a group of people right at the top who say, is what we're doing in line with the fact that we're a publicly traded company? And they have a responsibility to their shareholders to make sure that they do this. So they go through phases where they say, our strategy is to buy back our shares. And by doing that, they limit the amount of available shares and they try and artificially push up their price. So, but the market knows that and is very well aware of it. And um, in most cases, it's actually published by the company saying that their intent is to buy it. You can even go one step further because CEOs of companies or people linked to companies have to disclose that they are, that they are buying their own shares in, in their company. So you can write a bot that goes and takes a look and says, okay, because it's publicly disclosed, who is buying how much of their shares? If you see a big public disclosure that so-and-so who is the CEO or marketing director of this company has taken um, a huge amount of shares in their company, that's a very positive buy signal. Um, you can even be more cynical and go and do the same thing with uh, politicians because very often politicians set incentives or governmental rules that benefit certain companies in certain sectors. Again, politicians are um, governed by laws that say they have to disclose what their public stock holding is, what their shareholding is. So you can write bots and there are people that do this that go and take a look and see when so-and-so who's sitting on the energy commission suddenly buys um, you know, uh, shares in a, in a company that explores for oil, that's probably like a good bet that something's going to happen there. <laughs> um, so that is definitely being done and it's definitely something that can be built into uh, trading. Okay, thank you. I got that. Awesome. I, th I think this is great. I hope that everybody has understood uh, the conceptual framework and what it really needs. And now they can look into the questions and the tasks in more, um, with more understanding. Definitely keep asking in Slack and discuss uh, as we go. And thank you, Jacques, for your time. And yeah, let's just close here. So uh, 10 Academy team, you can actually stop the recording. And I think we can stop here. Thank you, guys. Take Thanks. care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.